There's a member of the church who we met in South Carolina. He was a phenomenal and is a phenomenal guitarist. He plays a different style than does Randy DeBruyler. But Dean Franklin, amazing guitarist. And one of the songs that uh, he would play was Communication Breakdown, which is driving rock song. He would play it along with a host of others. And on, on request, he would switch from that song to another song to another song. And it was fascinating to watch him. But I got to thinking about the idea of communication breakdown. And uh, that's what we have a lot of times. We know that we live in the world, we interact in the world, but sometimes, we do have a breakdown in communication, a failure to communicate. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But if you look at James, the third chapter, and you begin in verse five, James writes the following. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. Behold, how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defines, defiles the entire body, sets on fire the course of our life, and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and birds, of reptiles, creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Yikes. And to think we have that within our arsenal. James says we need to be very careful. Nobody can tame it. Nobody. The slip of the tongue. The heart is revealed through that which we speak. The tongue reveals the essence of the heart. That's what Jesus was bringing out back in Matthew, the 12th chapter, verses 35, 36, and 37. We reveal it. And now I think about the things that I say, the things that I reveal about myself. Tells you what kind of person I am. Person that likes stupid movies and, and glories in them. Challenges others to watch them for mind-numbing exercise. But that's not what fills my heart. It is a passing part of who I am. It is, as it were, the toy department of life. But we do spend a lot of time involved in communication. And what we say can either condemn us or exalt us. We can be justified or condemned. So stop and think. In your life, what does your communication say about you? Because that's a key. In the movie Cool Hand Luke, there was a great there was a great scene. Struther Martin talking to Paul Newman, Southern drawl thicker than molasses, and I won't even try to replicate it. But what we have here is a failure to communicate. Oh, it's a great line. Probably one of the greatest lines spoken in movies. And there have been a lot. So what do we communicate? 
How do we go about it? Well, we realize that communication is dualistic in its approach. Go back with me, if you would, into the book of Ecclesiastes. I, I think you can see it on the overhead. For those over here on my left, I realize that when you look now, that you're not seeing all of the overhead, but you're getting more of a glimpse of me. How lucky you are. Ecclesiastes 7. Go down to verse 21. In verse 21. Also, do not take seriously. Some translations have um, give your heart to. Do not take seriously all words which are spoken. Lest you hear your servant cursing you. For you also have realized that you likewise have many times cursed others. Now the word curse there, we use the word curse in a different way today. But it's speak evil of as it's back there. Um, the word curse as we use it today, we think of profane language. We think of taking the name of God in vain. Uh, things of that nature. And it's funny how over time, society begins to accept certain words. And they go, oh, that's not bad. We can use that word. But look what he's saying. Don't take seriously all words spoken. We take a lot of things to heart. I know people tease me. And I like it. And I know sometimes people say things to me that aren't easy. And I may not like it, but yet I have to take it to heart. Because what I've got to do is I've got to grow from it and learn from it. So what that tells me is that communication is a two-way street. There's going to be positives. There's going to be negatives. And there's going to be someone who encodes the message. Right now, I'm encoding to you a message. What you have to do is try to decode the message that I'm sending. Now, that's basically stated another way. You're the receiver. You're the listener. And I'm the one doing the speaking. And when you're the listener, when you're the receiver, the scriptures teach us, based on what we saw there, don't overreact. And we do that. We project when we listen. We do that all the time. Did I hear you to say? Well, no. That's not what I was saying at all. You didn't hear me. Well, you were yelling at me. No, I didn't raise my voice. What you just said was yelling at me. But I didn't raise my voice. See, sometimes what we do is if somebody says something we don't like, that is them yelling at us. Yelling is yelling, and that's not yelling. So when we begin to have communication breakdowns, it can be on the part of the one encoding or the part on the one decoding. And so here, what Solomon says, try to decode acceptably. Don't take all the words seriously. Now, I would never deign say that if my wife were telling me something. Linda, the scriptures say, I'm not to take all the words seriously that you say. That would be taking it clearly out of context. And that would be rude, crude, and boorish on my part. But what they are saying and what Solomon is bringing to the forefront, don't look for the negative. Don't project a negative where it's at. It's, it's not always there. 
By the same token, we're going to see that we have to control our response. And we know that by what James writes. James writes, but let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak. That's in James 1.19. So in our communication, we're doing all of these things by taking time to really think. If you need to, do a perception check. Somebody is talking to you. Signify. You know, hold on a second and ask a question. Did I hear you to say, this is the understanding I had from what you were saying? Is that what you meant? Give the person a chance to clarify. That's called perception checking. Make sure you're all on the same page. While Solomon doesn't use those words, nor does James, yet it is clearly implied by the passages we just read and the one we just quoted. And then control your response. You don't want to inflame something. And give due consideration. So it's, you know, you boil it down into this way. It's easy to say. It's easy to bring out these dynamics and to look at the dynamics and say, well, how could we have a failure to communicate when it's so easy? Because we're humans. And even though we look at these things, even though we want to give due deference to one another, we ask for perception checks, all of those things, nevertheless, we still have a major problem with communication. You know, a few years ago, this was popular. Eh, talk to the hand. And you'd see people doing that, more women than men. I would have a real problem of a lot of men going, eh, talk to the hand. But that's, that's what we basically do. We sometimes just talk to something that's not going to be able to hear. Communication is dualistic. Go back into the book of Proverbs. And we're going to go into Proverbs, the 18th chapter. And Solomon has a lot to say about language, about the use of the tongue, not only in Ecclesiastes, but especially in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Great scene. And by now you know that I, I'm a visual person. In the movie The Outlaw Josie Wales, Chief Ten Bears is talking with Josie Wales. And he talks about there is power in your words, power of life and of death. They stole that from Proverbs. That line plagiarized, popped out and inserted, because that's what we just read. Look at it again. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. But that's all right. That's all right that they did that. Because for a lot of people, it gives a visual. I can, even as I'm talking about it, I can see the faces of both, of both actors. Understanding the drama that's there. And the power of the words that are spoken. And we have to realize that. Because even as Paul writes in Ephesians 4, chapter verse 29, he's basically saying words are not neutral. Words have meaning. And we're trying to communicate. We're trying to tell somebody something. There's a little boy on the news last night. And uh, he's in, unable to communicate verbally. He's not able to move much of anything. He's constrained to a wheelchair. And it's... It looks like a 
elongated, oversized baby carriage. And he was at the horse race yesterday. And I forget the name of the horse, but the last name was Wish. And the first name was the boy's name. And that boy had a wish. And the horse won. Oh, it didn't win the Breeders' Cup. But it won one of the races leading up to the Breeders' Cup. It was a great feel-good story. And you watched it. And then the sports reporter asked the parents of the young boy who was there to watch the horse win. The horse came over after the victory and nuzzled the boy. And then the parents began talking for the boy. Oh, he feels wonderful. He's, he's, he's elated. And all these things that the parents suspected that the boy would say if he could speak. But the boy didn't need to speak. The boy communicated differently. You could see in his eyes when the horse came near. You could read what he was trying to communicate. And I agree with what the parents said, that that's probably what he was trying to say if he could say it. But words and expressions are not neutral. I am guilty of having an expressive face, at least when I talk to my wife. And she'll go, what do you mean by that? And I go, I mean nothing. Well, that's not what your face said. Um, our expressions speak a lot. And I've got to realize that. And I really don't mean anything by whatever expression I may be showing. But by the same token, we have to recognize that the words we say have tremendous power. And when you look at the seven things that God hates, a lying tongue, spreading falsehood among, strife among brethren, gossip, and so on, of the seven, how many deal with the tongue? We get ourselves in a world of problems with our tongue. And so what we want to do is we want to utilize and communicate that which is acceptable, that which is positive. You're there in Proverbs 18. Flip over to uh, the 26th chapter of Proverbs. And drop down with me, if you would, into verse 18. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, boy, this one hurts. Was I not joking? <sighs> I am prone to do that. I do not... I, 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 uh, man, I'm shooting myself in the foot. I tease a lot. And I don't know sometimes how people take it. And when I think they're going to take it wrong, or they've taken it wrong, I go, you know, I was only kidding. I'm just teasing with you. If I follow the scriptures, I can't do that. I shouldn't do that. My communication should be different. And I look at that and I go, man, I feel bad. I really do feel bad. Because I've done that my whole life. And I really didn't think that much about it. Because that's just me. I like to tease and have a little bit of fun. But communication breakdown is that you need to know your listener. You need to know who you could do that to. 
You can do that to Janice. You can tease her. But you also need to talk to her in a straightforward manner. And sometimes you need to lift her up. You need to do those things. So the more we interact with people, the more we understand the communication dynamics, we need to have one with another. And we can't fall back and just say, oh, hey, I was teasing. Because quite honestly, man, I'm glad I'm preaching because I'm on the front row. Um, in comedy, whether I say it or not, you can read about it and study it. In comedy, there is a lot of truth to what's being put forth. Most comedians have a lot of pain, a lot of angst. And by following into, I was kidding, they're able to vent and to get some things out behind a ruse of laughter. And Solomon said, you can't do that. You can't waffle away and offer it up as an excuse every time. You can't. But we do know one another. We know what we can say. And if we stumble and cause offense, we need to have enough love, if we're the one being offended, to tell the one. You know, I, I hope you didn't mean it the way that I received it. A perception check. Did you really mean to say that to me? Is that what you meant? I want some clarification. So, in other words, if you're offended by something, you don't understand why somebody said something out of the kindness and love out of your heart. You should turn to him and say, you know, I kind of took that wrong because surely you didn't mean what you just said. Give them a chance to clarify. What we want in the body of Christ, what we want in any family, is a harmonious relationship. The idea of a disclaimer, we just looked at. And we can't be doing that all the time. Well, communication breakdown comes back to basically two options. Positive. Words of gratitude. You're there in Proverbs. Turn over a few chapters to the 12th chapter. And in the 12th chapter, go down to verse 18. There is one who speaks rashly, thrusts of a sword. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. We need to do that. We need to bring healing. We need to speak words of gratitude, words of trust, words of hope, of optimism, words of love. In my mind, I've got this, this melody running through it and uh, an earworm type of thing from an old, old, old song by Cass Elliot. Words of love so soft and tender. And it's just going through that repetition. But that's what we need to have. And not just love that's, that's flowery and that nature. But love that is true, love that is genuine. Love that would exist between brethren in Christ. Love that exists in a family. And we are a family. Trust. Trust is really important. Do you really trust your brethren? Trust them implicitly? Do you have hope? All of those things. In the book of Philemon, and I, I'm beginning to really appreciate 
that really short book so much because in the book of Philemon, Paul is asking Omnismus and Philemon to do something that is really, really hard. Onesimus, who was a runaway slave, Paul tells them, you were wrong. You need to go back. You need to make it right. To Philemon, he says, I'm sending Onesimus back to you, but not back as a runaway slave. Don't see him that way. See him as a brother in Christ. And I want you to welcome him back. Because he's coming back penitent. And you need to welcome him back forgivingly. But look at verse 7. For I've come to have much joy and confident in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. I have confidence in you that you will do the right thing. Even without saying that, he's implying it. Do we have that kind of communication one with another? That I have confidence in you? That you'll always do the right thing? I would hope so. And I would hope you would communicate that one to another. 12th chapter, verse 18. There is one who speaks rashly, which we looked at. I like that one. Sometimes we speak without even thinking. So the positive is pretty evident. The negative, well, we've already seen that. We've seen it in 1218. But what about murmuring? Murmuring goes back to basically on an on an this indiscriminate sound that goes about and that people do. They grumble, mumble, 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 mumble. They're never satisfied, never happy. And they grumble among themselves, murmuring. Solomon talks about Ecclesiastes 10, verse 20. Paul talks about murmuring in a very generic way in Philippians 2, 14. Murmuring. We hear it sometimes. Indiscriminate, complaining, and people just not being happy. We need to be happy people. Communicate that happiness. What do we got to complain about? We really don't have anything to complain. We might have trouble with the job. We might have trouble with family. We might have trouble with friends. Look at the bright side. You got a job. You have friends. And you have a family. You're fortunate. You're fortunate. And yes, you can begin to change some of those things. Change the dynamic of your family. Change situations at work. You're not there indentured forever. It's one of the great things about this country. You can better yourself. There's always alternatives. But we don't want to go around because the heart is revealed by what we say. And we surely don't want that. We don't want to come off as an ingrate. Go over to Colossians, third chapter. And in this third chapter, Paul is talking about putting on the new self. And if you drop down into verse 8, but now you also put aside all anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self 
with conceivable practices. I put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge, according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man. But Christ is all in and all. He then goes on talking further about the role and the, the dynamic that we come together as one. So you got a couple of options. You can either be positive in your communication or you can be negative. Choice is yours. But if you choose negative, the breakdown between you and the others you wish to communicate with is going to be clearly observant. But do practice every so often. Practice perception checks. When you're listening to someone, did I understand you to say? That's what I heard. Did I hear you to say? And give them a chance. Don't always think it's negative. Don't always do that. And we're prone to jump to that conclusion. You don't have to raise your voice. Sometimes people say that I yell. I do not yell. I don't yell. I may be firm in what I say, but that's not yelling. And just because somebody tells you something is wrong doesn't mean they're yelling at you. And if you think that, then say, did I hear you yelling at me? Because I don't really do well when somebody yells at me. Oh, no, I wasn't yelling. Great. Because I don't do good with somebody yelling. Communication can be easy. Communication can be sweet. Because what we don't want is we don't want to use our tongue to bring about the death of a relationship. James said we need to think before we speak. So, think. Look at the acronym. Make it an acronym. First, T. Is it true? H. Is it helpful? I. Does it inspire? N. Is it necessary? And K. And I think this is probably the most important. Well, is it true? But the other one is K. Is it kind? Think in your communication. True, helpful, inspiring, necessary. Is it kind? Because words have power. I saw this picture. If you look closely at it, you see that her mouth has a gun. And how many times have you heard, there you go, shooting your mouth off again. And we do that a lot. And I saw that and I just kind of chuckled and realized, that's me. That's me. And I do indeed need to be careful. So yes, I was preaching at me this afternoon. Was I kind? Sometimes probably not so much. Was I truthful? I would like to think so. Because we backed it up with scriptures. I don't want to begin to be a forgetful hearer. As James talks about in the first chapter in verse 25. I want to be an effectual doer for the cause of Christ. And I do not in any way, shape, or form want to have my tongue get in the way of all of that. Well, the lesson is yours this afternoon. And I realize it was not what one would call a traditional lesson where we talk about the necessity to 
render obedience to the gospel or things of that nature. But moreover, an important part of our life, communication. And we have breakdowns all the time. All the time we have communication breakdowns. We definitely don't want that. And so if we're going to grow together, we need to learn more about one another. And we need to keep our communication honest, sincere. And if we have trouble in our communication, if we don't understand what somebody says, because we all have different personalities, stop and say, did I hear you to say? Or this is what I heard you to say. And that clarifies the situation so quick. Well, the lesson is yours this afternoon. But if there's any that might be subject to the invitation anyway, we'd invite you to come while we stand and sing this song. <laughs>